Hey guys, welcome back to Sports Betting Truth, and we got another post from Reddit. I saw this pop up a few days ago, and like everything, um, I was very skeptical of it, even though it got a lot of upvotes, and I'm going to pick this post apart. And so this poster, Wakanda Balls, said he found an easy way to bet and make money on DraftKings. And he says, during college basketball games, they have a flash props option. During these flash props, you can bet if the next field goal is a two-pointer or a three-pointer. The two-pointer is usually minus 280 to minus 400, depending on the time of game, and the three-pointer is usually plus 200 to plus 400. And so user Wakanda Ball says, I have figured out that exclusively betting the two-point field goal bet has made me incredible gains. I look for teams with bad three-point shooting, and some of them will bury barely jack a three all game. For example, today I bet 15 times on Cal Poly versus Hawaii and turned $5 into $250. It can literally happen within a half. Some things I've learned. You want to do research and make sure the game you're going to ride and make sure they're bad three-point shooters and don't take many threes. Don't bet near the end of half or near the end of game. Try to use a fast computer and fast internet speed to be able to keep up. Watch the game as you bet. You'll be able to tell tempo who's hot, who's not, and all of that. And be wary of teams that are far behind. They might start jacking up threes. So I'm sure you all clicked on this video to see me answer the question, is this a good strategy? I'm sure a lot of people are going to automatically assume that I'm going to say, no, it's not. And while I would say that it's probably not as much of a sure thing as this guy makes it out to be, there's one point he made that actually raised some suspicion for me. And that was the fourth point he made. Watch the game as you bet. You'll be able to tell Tempo who's hot, who's not watching live with flash props should be a no-brainer. So as someone who's built an extensive college basketball model that use a Monte Carlo approach, any good basketball model out there, especially one that DraftKings is probably using, is going to know a team's tendencies. It's going to factor in how the distribution of a team's two and three point attempts, if they like to shoot twos, if they like to shoot threes on offense, as well as how they play defense. Do they play defense in a way that attempts to limit a team's two-point shots or three-point shots? A good example would be Syracuse in their 2-3 zone. A lot of teams shoot more threes than usual against Syracuse because they kind of take away the paint with that zone defense. Similar to Virginia's pack line defense, they really take away the paint, so teams are forced to take more jumpers and threes to beat them. And then you have teams that play transition that are going to give up easy twos a lot more uh, because that's kind of what they're giving up to try to get steals to get out in transition. So a lot of those things can be mined based on a team's statistical profile and fingerprint on both offense and defense. So any model that's going to be used to set lines for this is going to take that into account, a team's tendencies. Otherwise, you would see the same line for every team, every game, regardless. So teams that shoot a lot of threes, obviously their three-pointer next field goal made is going to be lower, as well as if you're playing it's a team that uh, packs the paint and is giving up the three, then they're probably going to expose themselves to more threes than a team that plays heavy man or something like that and has a little bit less going on in the paint. With that being said, those models are going to do a good job at recapping how a team has played up to that date, but what if a team changes their strategy on the fly? What if all of a sudden a team that plays mostly man defense switches to a zone and takes away the paint in the middle of the game? Well, now all of a sudden, the team that you're they're playing against is probably going to be more apt to shoot a three-pointer than their statistics leading up to that game historically would lead you to believe. So there might be some value in creating a model at trying to take advantage of those situations where a team is wanting to play a certain way, but the way they're being defended means they have to kind of change that up. It's kind of like with tempo. Um, tempo is one of the hardest stats to measure in a, any basketball model because, yeah, you can create a model that measures teams' tempo tendencies based on how they've played up to that point, but it's not always going to tell you the full story. For example, say you have a team that runs an ultra-slow Princeton offense like um, Air Force under Joe Scott right now, slow Princeton offenses. What if they get behind early? What if they fall behind um, 
20 to nothing off the opening tip. Do you think they're still going to play their molasses slow Princeton offense in terms of tempo? Probably not. They're probably going to want to speed things up so they can get back in the game because if they play too slow, there's not going to be enough possessions remaining for them to come back. So even though they want to play at a slow play pace, they now have to play at a faster pace. And that's not how they want to play, but it's how they're forced to play based on the game situation. So that applies here. A team that wants to shoot a lot of threes, but the opposing defense is taking the three-pointer away from them, is going to be forced to shoot more twos, and therefore that might not be reflected in the models that DraftKings is using here to set lines based on whether or not the next made shot is going to be a two or a three. And so I do think there could be an angle there, because teams that make adjustments or in-game um, defend a team in a way that might be the antithesis of how they played up to that point in the season. There could be value there. I don't know how much because especially over the span of uh, tw- uh, 15 to 20 games towards the middle end of the season, you're going to have a big enough sample size where all that is ironed out. But in this case, it would be interesting to look at. And so, you know, when I had a very successful, uh, successful college basketball live betting model myself a couple years ago, it was very simple. Uh, But at the same time, it definitely took things like that into account. Oftentimes, you would see things kind of go weary where teams were forced to play in a style they didn't want to play. But the ultimate reason I would say this is not as easy as this Wakanda Balls user says it is, is because live betting has higher juice than pregame betting. You'll often see uh, minus 120 or higher sides when you're live betting. So you have a higher threshold of bets you need to win in order to profit when it comes to live betting. And that's the downside of live betting because sportsbooks expose themselves to more risk when it comes to live betting because, because really they don't have time for the market to sharpen these lines for live betting. So to compensate, they have higher juice. And so you're going to have to do a lot better than you traditionally would have in order to beat any kind of live betting proposition. And this is no different. And so you have a lot higher bar you need to clear. So ultimately, yes, this is too good to be true. There could be some angles to it, but ultimately I think the the juice that you have to beat is going to be too high. Um, But I do think if you had the time, it would be worth building a model to try to take advantage of it. And that's another thing. You'd have to be lightning quick. You would have to be lightning quick here with your models and everything. And that's also hard. Um, So, yeah. Anyway, I want us to look at the comments to see if they're kind of bringing this guy back down to earth. Jigga. 23B says, okay, bro, if you think your TV is ahead of the ticking data that DraftKings or FanDuel or any legit sportsbook uses, you're out of your mind. That is absolutely true. I would see this a lot when live betting myself back in the day is that... (laughs) The sports books would be ahead of whatever I had that I was using to bet live. You are behind whatever feed the sports books are getting. I can guarantee you that. There's no way to get a bet in when a fast break starts before the layup is actually hit. What? Yep, absolutely true. Yeah, a lot of people are, you know, being sarcastic, quitting my job now. Turning five dollars into two fifty with minus two eighty odds and fifteen bets is extremely probable. That also is true. You'd have to hit like thirteen straight rollovers. That's true. Um, every live betting edge or niche I've ever developed goes belly up pretty fast after getting cocky and greedy. So yeah, I think a lot of the commenters are right. Um, this might and also small sample size as well. I mean, how long has this guy been doing this? But ultimately, in order to beat something like this, you need a pretty good model that can keep up, that is fast, that isn't behind, and takes a lot of factors into account. And ultimately, I think number four, his comment number four, watching the game as you bet to see if uh, teams are playing in a style they didn't anticipate playing, you would have to factor that into any model as well. So no, not a profitable bet, but it does it does uh, create a lot of interesting questions and concepts. And this was a fun uh post to talk about off the cuff. I don't script any of these videos. I don't even read a lot of these posts before I hit the record button on these videos um, because I like to talk off the cuff. I I like to be unscripted. And so this is no exception. Um, I just see really the title of the the post and then I open it and then I'm going to create a video on it after I hit the record button. Anyway, you've been watching Sports Betting Truths. Stay tuned for more unscripted commentary like this on sports betting subjects. Uh, separate the wheat from the chaff, get information from me instead of the crap sports betting influencers and personalities out there. They are a dime a dozen guys. Anyway, see ya.